Welcome and thank you for joining us for the first day of the ASEAN Law Academy Advanced Program 2021, a program organized by the Center for International Law of the National University of Singapore. I am Yvette, your MC for the Academy. Before the Academy begins, we would like to remind Academy participants to keep their videos on while attending the lecture and to mute themselves whenever they are not speaking. Today's session comprises a public live streamed opening lecture by Professor Tommy Koh, followed by a closed door session for Academy participants. Allow me to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Nilifer Oral, the director of the Center for International Law, who will commence the Academy proper. Dr. Oral, please. Thank you so much uh, and greetings to all of you. Professor Tommy Ko, directors of the ASEAN Law Academy, Professor Joseph Weiler and Dr. Uh, Tan Sien Lee, dear participants of the 2021 ASEAN Law Academy Advanced Program. A warm welcome to all of you uh, and welcome to the ASEAN Law Academy Advanced Program. Today, we are pleased to conduct our third iteration of the ASEAN Law Academy for public officials, practitioners, and university professors. We are delighted that our first two academies received enthusiastic participation and resoundingly good feedback. Although unfortunately it is not possible this session uh, be conducted in person in Singapore, we are glad that in spite of the pandemic, and challenges facing all countries in the world, we are still able to offer the Academy online for the first time. We are pleased that we have received a good response with more than 100 participants from the Southeast Asia region and beyond. Again, both the public and private sectors are well represented. This is a particularly challenging time globally despite instances of states favoring unilateral action and the escalation of tensions in trade relations, international cooperation remains an important avenue for countries to develop and prosper. Regional cohesion, such as in ASEAN, remains even more important than ever. As individual states, the ASEAN markets have in recent years been comparatively attractive in terms of trade and investment. While that is good and welcome, ASEAN as a collective and cohesive bloc will be an even more attractive growth area that would bring about greater development to the region and its member states. Since the adoption of the ASEAN Charter in 2007, ASEAN members have taken substantive steps towards integration and community building for regional peace and prosperity. This urgency has become even more important with the onset of COVID-19 pandemic and ASEAN's unique position to work with its external partners in strengthening global supply chains. Likewise, the Center for International Law at the National University of Singapore is a firm proponent of ASEAN integration and regional development. Established in response to the growing need for international law thought leadership and capacity building the Asia Pacific, CIL, whether in the law of the sea, climate change of the environment, ASEAN investment law, or its dedicated ASEAN law and policy research, research pillar has produced work that examines regional phenomena in both the intellectual parameters of scholarship as well as in practical legal and policy aspects. The CIL ASEAN Integration Through Law Project has in the past 10 years involved more than 80 scholars from ASEAN around the world. The team has engaged a wide range of officials and scholars on various policy recommendations at plenaries on ASEAN integration, and the project co-directors have presented the project findings to the ASEAN senior officials meetings and the ASEAN ministerial meeting. In academia, the team has produced cutting edge scholarship in the CIL ASEAN integration through law book series published by Cambridge University Press and establishing the field of ASEAN integration studies in its own right. The ASEAN Law Academy is an extension of the ASEAN Integration Through Law Project. Taught by experienced professors and practitioners, the program comprises engaging interactive sessions and employs practice-based learning for greater relevance to the workplace. 
We hope you will enjoy learning more about regional integration with us and find your academy experience useful as we deepen us in community building to benefit the peoples of our region. And I wish you all an excellent program this session. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Aral. Next, please allow me to introduce the co-director of the ASEAN Law Academy, Professor Joseph Weiler. Dr. Aral, Ambassador Coyle, ladies and gentlemen, it's a pleasure and an honor to be here. Now, everybody, I was about to say sitting here, but everybody participating with us on Zoom has an interest in ASEAN. And you will all know that in some ways it's a moving target. It expands, new agreements are signed, new challenges emerge. Uh, it becomes ever more difficult to master the subject matter. Now, there are two groups of people that attend our annual academy. One are what we call the doers, uh, policy makers, uh, officials of the member states of ASEAN on whose expertise and competence and knowledge in some deep way, the success of ASEAN depends. And the second group, uh, university teachers who both are engaged in research to deepen our knowledge and understanding of ASEAN, the challenges it faces, the solutions it can give, but also have, and I use this word advisedly, the sacred trust of teaching a new generation of students, future leaders, future doers, future teachers, future citizens of our member states. Now, what are we trying to achieve here? What do we hope you will get out of these sessions? So at one level, it's kind of obvious. For some of you, it will be refreshing. For others, it will be an occasion to specialize, to learn a subject matter that perhaps you were less familiar with uh, before. For some, it might even be a first systematic encounter with ASEAN as a system. Uh, the various sessions are designed to both give an overview of ASEAN, but also allow you to choose specific areas which issue you in particular, either because that's what you are engaged in, both as academics or as policymakers, as state officials. Uh, but also to specialize, to check your knowledge, to engage. Uh, but there's another function of the academy and it's part of its real identity. It's putting people together who actually have experience of ASEAN. And one of the most important things we do here is not just put a teacher in front of you, a professor, academic, and experienced policymaker, but to put all of us together that one can learn from each other's experience. You will see in the various sessions of the academy, there will always be a moment where the instructor will say, so how do you perceive that? What has been your experience in facing this type of problem? And you will find at the end of the session that you have learned from each other as much as you have learned from the instructors, the specialists which we have uh, selected. So I hope this session is as successful as the previous ones. I hope it will be, despite the challenges of Zoom, uh, uh, enjoyable and fruitful and productive session for you and for us who will of course be learning from you. So I wish everybody a very, very enjoyable, productive learning experience with us. Thank you. Now, <clears throat> it's uh, my pleasure to invite our keynote speaker, uh, Ambassador Professor Tommy Cole. Now, in English, there's an expression, been there, done that. Uh, and often I think that that expression has been formulated 
with Tommy Coe in mind. <laughs> he has been there and done that in every area of foreign policy, of diplomacy. He's also a professor. Uh, it's hard to find an area of diplomatic activity, uh, of foreign policy, of governance, where Tommy Coe has not had significant experience. And when it comes to ASEAN, uh, is one of the makers of ASEAN. He's hand, had his hand in the design, <clears throat> to just give one example, of the charter. Uh, when you have a problem, how do I understand this provision or that provision? He has a little bit of good advice. Write a little note to Tomiko and say, how do you ex understand that? And he will not only give you a professional view of an experienced lawyer, how to interpret it, he will say, I remember on that day, on that day, the representative of this country said this, and this is why we chose that. Uh, it's a unique experience to learn, to listen to Ambassador Tomiko. It's my pleasure to invite you, Tommy, to give our keynote opening lecture. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Thank you. Um, I would like to thank Dr. Oral, Prof. Weiler, Prof. Tan Sien Lee for inviting me to deliver the first lecture in the 2021 ASEAN Law Academy. <clears throat> I've chosen as a topic of my talk, ASEAN Three Biggest Challenges. And the three challenges are one, overcoming the pandemic, two, making an economic recovery from the recession, and three, maintaining ASEAN's unity and neutrality in the face of the intense rivalry between the United States and China. So let me turn to the first challenge. Let me begin with a little bit of uh, historical background. In 2003, a mysterious virus was discovered in the Guangdong province of China. It was transmitted from Hong Kong, transmitted to Hong Kong and from Hong Kong to the rest of the world. The WHO described this illness <clears throat> as SARS. ASEAN fell victim to the pandemic. Fortunately for the world, the SARS pandemic was short-lived. But ASEAN learned the lesson from SARS. ASEAN knew that it had to be prepared for the next pandemic. So towards this end, ASEAN has established five cooperative mechanisms. They are briefly one, a network of public health emergencies led by Malaysia, Two, a biodiaspora regional virtual center led by Philippines. Three, a regional public health laboratory network led by Thailand. Four, an ASEAN risk assessment and communication center. And finally, a rice stockpile. <clears throat> Did ASEAN react promptly to COVID-19 pandemic? I think the answer is yes. The foreign ministers of ASEAN held a special meeting of the ASEAN Coordinating Council on the 20th of February in Vientiane. It was a fiscal meeting. This was followed by meetings of ASEAN ministers in defense, economy, agriculture, forestry, health, tourism, and labor. The leaders of ASEAN held a virtual summit meeting on the 14th of April, 2020. And this was followed immediately afterwards by a summit with China, Japan, and South Korea. The ASEAN ministers also met virtually with their counterparts from such countries as the United States, the European Union, and Japan. ASEAN also worked closely with the World Health Organization. ASEAN invited the Director General of WHO, Dr. Tedros Adhanom Ghebreyesus, to participate in the ASEAN Plus Three Summit 
on the 14th of April last year. Individual ASEAN countries try to help each other with donations of test kits, gloves, masks, personal protective equipment, ventilator, polymerase chain reaction machines. And they also help each other by evacuating their citizens from third countries. There was a good spirit of ASEAN solidarity. However, however, I must point out that ASEAN is an intergovernmental organization. It is not a transnational organization like the European Union. The response of ASEAN to COVID-19 therefore depend less on ASEAN than on the individual member states. This explains the uneven manner in which the 10 countries have responded to the pandemic. <clears throat> Five ASEAN countries have reported very large numbers of infections. And these are first, Indonesia with over a million cases, the Philippines with over half a million cases, Malaysia with over 200,000 cases, Myanmar with over 140,000 cases, and Singapore with close to 60,000 cases. The five ASEAN countries with very low levels of infection are Thailand with about 19,000 cases, Vietnam with 1,800 cases, Cambodia with 460 cases, Brunei with 176 cases, and Laos with only 40 cases. The country, the ASEAN country, which has performed the best in suppressing COVID-19 is Vietnam. I will now say a few words about vaccines. In the case of the European Union, <clears throat> The union has entered into contracts <clears throat> with the pharmaceutical companies to buy vaccines for all 27 member states. In the case of ASEAN, it is every state for itself. Naturally, the wealthier states and those that acted early have got the vaccines first. China, Russia, and India are making available their vaccines to the developing countries as part of their vaccine diplomacy. My message to ASEAN is that no one is safe unless everyone is safe. It is therefore in the interest of every member state to help other member states acquire vaccines for their people. Let me now turn to the second challenge. The second challenge is the challenge of making an economic recovery from the recession caused by the pandemic. According to the IMF, this recession is worse than the 2008 financial crisis. In 2020, <laughs> Hello, uh, can I continue? Yes, please go on, Prof. Uh, according to IMF, this recession is worse than the 2008 financial crisis. The world economy shrank by 4.4% last year. The big surprise is that in the case of China, China managed to register a positive growth rate of 2.4% last year. As a result, emerging and developing Asia shrank by only 1.7%. However, in the case of Singapore, my own country, the economy shrank by 5.8%. Shrank by there was some good news, some good economic news in 2020. First, the 10 ASEAN countries, together with China, Japan, South Korea, Australia and New Zealand concluded a mega free trade agreement called the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership 
or RCEP. Concluding such an agreement strengthens free trade and weakens protectionism. The agreement also has the merit of consolidating and harmonizing ASEAN's free trade agreement with these various dialogue partners. Additionally, it is the first, first free trade agreement involving China, Japan, and South Korea. Those three countries have been trying to negotiate a trilateral free trade agreement for many years without success. The second, second good news is that the inflow of foreign direct investment into Vietnam, Singapore, and Malaysia was actually bigger in 2020 than 2019. I take this as a sign of confidence by the investors in those three economies and in ASEAN more generally. The third good news is that the ASEAN economy is projected to grow this year by 5.2%. Vietnam is projected to grow by over 10%. And both Indonesia and Malaysia are expected to make a strong recovery. The fourth good news is that in the medium to long term, ASEAN will remain will, re, will regain its high growth trajectory. It is expected to outperform the other regions of the world, with the exception of China and India. Do I have any concerns? My answer is yes, I have some concerns. So let me share my concerns with you. First, the recovery will not be even. Some countries will bounce back sooner than other countries. Within countries, some sectors will recover more quickly than other sectors. Even in 2020, in spite of the recession, some sectors of our economies actually grew. And these include computers and telecommunications, supermarkets, e-commerce. My second concern is this. The recession destroyed many businesses, jobs, and economic opportunities. This has resulted in rising unemployment, increase in poverty, and human misery. All this is happening in the midst of the fourth industrial revolution. What this means is that some of the jobs are not coming back. And working from home can mean working from anywhere. So your job is not, it's not safe. The world is also going digital. And unless the businesses and the people can change and adapt, they will not have a bright future. My third concern, a big question is whether in building back, ASEAN can build back in a fairer, more resilient and more sustainable manner. Can our economic policies incorporate our environmental policies can we, the government, business and people, agree to combat climate change, stop the mass extinction of the species and the degradation of our oceans? Can ASEAN stop the deforestation of our remaining rainforests? <clears throat> I go on to the third and final challenge. The third challenge is posed by the intense competition for influence by China and the United States in our region. According to the American scholar David Schombo, writing in his new book, Where the Great Powers Meet, the competition between these two great powers is most intense in Southeast Asia. What this means is that ASEAN unity is under threat. In fact, some commentators have argued that ASEAN is already divided. My response is that 
individual ASEAN countries can choose to be closer to one great power or the other. However, ASEAN as a group <clears throat> must remain united and neutral. Let me explain why. A divided ASEAN is of no value to the world. And if ASEAN becomes pro-China, the United States will destroy it. If ASEAN were to become pro-US, China will destroy it. And I will remind my ASEAN colleagues that it is remarkable that every year, the leaders of the most powerful countries in the world, including the United States, China, Russia, Japan, and India, come and meet us at our annual ASEAN summit and related summit. This doesn't happen anywhere else in the world not in South Asia, not in West Asia, not in Africa, and not in Latin America. The leaders of the world will stop coming to the annual ASEAN summit and related summit if ASEAN loses its unity and neutrality. I would like to say something in the light of recent development in Myanmar. ASEAN unity cannot be taken for granted. The 10 diverse and heterogeneous countries, each with its own governance system, will exert continuous centrifugal forces on ASEAN. However, all 10 countries have signed on to the ASEAN Charter and have committed to uphold principles of democracy, the rule of law, good governance, constitutional government, the protection of human rights and fundamental freedom. With an adroit chair Brunei as our chairman this year, I'm confident that ASEAN unity will weather any upset that may come. I will conclude by making three points. First, ASEAN has a bright economic future. We must, however, not become complacent. ASEAN's aspiration to build a single economy out of 10 through the ASEAN Economic Community Project is incomplete. The private sector would like to see the remaining obstacles to integration, especially in the form of the non-tariff barriers be removed. It is also an imperative for individual ASEAN economies to undertake the necessary legal and regulatory reform in order to gain competitiveness. The recent reforms in Indonesia Vietnam and Philippines are therefore to be lauded. Second, the COVID-19 pandemic had taught us that ASEAN must raise its game. I would like to see greater cooperation and more solidarity in the acquisition and distribution of vaccines. I was heartened to learn that the ASEAN foreign minister discussed this issue in their recent retreat in January, and they agreed to utilize the COVID-19 ASEAN response fund for the procurement of vaccines, medical supplies and equipment for the people of ASEAN. The truth is, no ASEAN country should be left behind because no country is safe unless all 10 countries are safe. Third, ASEAN unity and neutrality will be severely tested in the coming years. The stakes are very high. If ASEAN become divided or partisan, then the ASEAN story will be over. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Professor Ko, for that lecture. We now have some time for a question and answer session with Professor Ko. We invite participants to use the raise hand function to address questions from the floor. You're also welcome to type your questions into the chat if your video and microphone aren't working as well. Yes, I see a, a question from Mr. Logan Masilamani. Yes, thank you. Um, it's uh, Dr. Masilamani. But uh, Professor Tommy Go, I, I'm not too sure whether you remember me, but I interviewed you in 1995, long, long time ago, for my doctoral thesis in, in Singapore. Um, my question is actually to, the, to on the relevance of the contemporary issue was what's taking place in Myanmar right now. Um, uh, Myanmar, when Myanmar was coming into ASEAN as a member, there was considerable push from pushback from from the EU and, yeah. and the US and so forth and so forth. I think you know all that. Yeah. Uh, I'm just wondering, what do you see the response should be from ASEAN, the other nine ASEAN members right now? Uh, what happened in Myanmar recently is the setback. Um, setback from Myanmar's own point of view and setback from the point of view of ASEAN. Um, as the statement put out by the ASEAN Chair Brunei um, indicate the 10 of us are committed to certain principles and purposes in the ASEAN Charter. And these have not uh, been abided by uh, in Myanmar. It is also inconsistent with Myanmar's own uh, ambition. It was the former military government that initiated the Myanmar roadmap to democracy. And you'll remember that, that there was a lot of skepticism in, in Europe and in America about whether the roadmap for democracy is for real or whether it's just propaganda. But it was for real. I mean, the military government actually drafted a new constitution, uh, allowed the NLP, NL, NLD to participate in a by-election in 2011, allow NLD to participate fully in the election and the military are willing to cede power to NLD. So we were hoping that uh, Myanmar will continue along this path of uh, constitutional development towards democracy. So what happened over the weekend in Myanmar is a setback. But as you know, <laughs> the rule in the ASEAN family is that we can't interfere in the internal affairs of other countries. No? And uh, both the ASEAN chair and the Singapore government statement has called upon our friends in Myanmar to respect the principles and purposes of the ASEAN chapter, to um, seek reconciliation and to return to normalcy. It is significant that in Brunei's statement, it talked about a return to normalcy in accordance to the will and the interests of the people of Myanmar. I think this is a hint to the recent election that was held in Myanmar. But, uh, but we, we can't interfere. We just hope that things will turn out right and that we are not going backwards to uh, 2011 or to uh, 2007. Thank you. Prof. Ko, we have a question from Krishnan Gopal Insan. Yeah. Thank you, Professor, for a uh, wonderful uh, uh, guest, uh, guest lecture. You. And uh, I, uh, you talked about vaccine diplomacy. Yes. So my question is, uh, what, what is your opinion? What kind of role Asian can play, uh, particularly you spoke about India and China? Yes. Uh, that they will be playing the yeah. uh, role. Yeah. So, uh, how Asian countries can develop an uh, advanced level of diplomacy with all these countries to yeah. boost the economic co cooperation with de developed economies, yeah. Yeah. which will help the Asian as a unit to overcome the uh, economic recession which we have seen because yeah. of the pandemic. Yes, yeah. thank you. Uh, in the case of India, um, India is actually producing in India, the AstraZeneca vaccine, the Oxford vaccine. 
And I believe that you've already supplied some of this vaccine to Myanmar, yeah? This is very helpful. The Russians have supplied Sputnik V, I think to the Philippines. And the Chinese have supplied their vaccine to, um, to Indonesia and also to the Philippines. So, so I'm, I'm, I'm thankful you know, to India, to China and to Russia for helping. Other countries have uh, sourced vaccines, both from the United States, Moderna, and to, to, to buy this joint venture vaccine between the United States and Germany, the Pfizer BioNTech. Yeah? So there's a, a, a diversified portfolio of vaccines. My concern is that all the countries in ASEAN will be able to acquire vaccine for their people. You know, I don't want any ASEAN country because of their lack of financial resources to be deprived of vaccine. Because my concern is no one is safe in ASEAN until everyone is safe. So it is in the interest of all countries. It's in the interest of wealthier country to help make available vaccine to the less wealthy countries. So I thank India for your help. Prof Ko, we have uh, a question from Professor Weiler. Thank you. If we look at the, the two major powers, if you want, outside Asia, uh, Europe, the European Union and the United States, I think it's fair to say that uh, not only has their reputation been seriously tarnished, but uh, they are facing a kind of crisis that we haven't seen before. Uh, in the United States, it's exemplified by those unprecedented scenes of uh, the attack on the Capitol. Yeah. And uh, in Europe, there's the earthquake of Brexit, which was a true earthquake, but also the uh, remarkable underperformance of Europe in facing the pandemic. Uh, it lags the world in terms of pre preparedness and distribution of the vaccine. So I have a kind of general question. A, what is the view from Asia on these two things? And are there any lessons that uh, we can learn here? I mean, in Asia. Um. Um, I, I don't want to criticize, you know, I, I don't want to criticize either America or Europe. And I think what happened recently in America, especially on the 6th of July, was a shock to the Asian countries and people. You know, we used to look up to America as a model of a functioning democracy. And we never expected that America would become so polarized that uh, very large numbers of Americans were not willing to recognize the legitimacy of the presidential election. This was a shock to, to many Asians. But I think with the election of Joe Biden and Kamala Harris, the process of healing the country has begun. So I'm hoping that it will take time and it will be very difficult, but I, I hope America will go back to the status quo ante, you know, of, of a country that is functioning where the two parties don't see each other as enemies, but treat each other with civility and is able to cooperate for the national good. But there's no question, but American soft power took a huge hit on the 6th of July. Uh, in the case of Europe, uh, I think the Brexit referendum was a shocker to Asians. You know, nobody in Asia expected that the British people would vote in a referendum to leave the European Union. Uh, most people thought the economic logic of the UK staying in the EU was so compelling. People forget that when a person go to vote, whether in a referendum or election, the person votes not just with their head, but also with their heart. And when the British people vote with their heart, they are concerned about identity, they are concerned about sovereignty. They are fearful of the large numbers of new people coming to Britain, including from Poland, where you are now. So Brexit is a setback, but it is, it is not 
veto either to the European Union or to the United Kingdom. The United Kingdom seems confident that it will be able to prosper outside the Europe. And as you know, uh, the Prime Minister Boris Johnson and his trade minister, Liz Truss, have been very proactive. They've concluded free trade agreements with Japan, with Singapore and Vietnam. They've applied to join the Comprehensive and Progressive Trans-Pacific Partnership, uh, and Singapore is supporting them. Uh, I won't comment about the not so effective performance of the European Union in the acquisition distribution of the vaccine in Europe. Thank you, Prof Ko. So there's uh, a great enthusiasm and we actually have uh, almost 10 questions waiting now, but uh, please okay. uh, bear with us. I will call you in turn. Uh, the next question is from Dr. Srikant. Uh, professor, uh, first of all, my congratulations are in order. I never got a chance to congratulate you for the Padma Shri that you received from the country where I reside. Uh, uh, not many people know that Professor Tommy is a Padma Shri recipient. Uh, so that being said, uh, uh, let me move away from the vaccine discussion and point you specifically to the ASEAN uh, uh, specifically. Yeah. So you talked about the GDP per capita and uh, some of the data that is coming in from the World uh, Bank reports. The GDP per capita of developed nations has been 91, whereas ASEAN has been five times of that per capita, which is a good sign. So that is more of a comment. So picking your, your uh, uh, aspect of TPP, which uh, UK acceded to two days back. Uh, no, so, no. Uh, UK is applied to join. It has not yet been admitted because it, it needs the consensus of the 11 countries, which are now members of CPTPP, but the UK has officially applied to join. So, so uh, be, uh, that being the case, are we looking at an ASEAN as a as a trivial and being a trivial entity in the overall partnerships that we're seeing all across the world? Be it SAR, be it a TPP, or uh, be it uh, should is that is that a need for us to actually move to a supranational status that we are not? Uh, and this has been an argument which has been going on for quite some time. Because so that is my first question to you. And second question would be, uh, uh, should we restrict ourselves to just 10 nations? Are we, are we uh, while we're talking about inclusivity amongst the 10 nations, should we go beyond the borders uh, and include the heavyweights? So let me just clarify something that you said. Huh? All 10 ASEAN countries are members of the RCEP, the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement of 15 countries. It was meant to be 16, but India opted out. You know? Not all 10 ASEAN countries are members of CPTPP. <laughs> Some ASEAN countries are not members of CPTPP, although my, my hope is that all 10 of them will join. You know? In the case of your country, India, may I just say that the 10 ASEAN country would India to reconsider its decision not to join RCEP. I, I want to make this point very sincerely to you. Trade is strategy. Trade is just not, it's not just common. Trade is strategy. And in my view, India cannot afford for Joe economic reason not to be part of this economic architecture, RCEP. The other reason is that the ASEAN countries and Japan would like India to be in because if India is part of RCEP, it gives a certain balance to the position of China, you know? So, so I'm, I'm, I'm just, I was so heartbroken when India decided to opt out RCEP and I'd like to make an appeal to you and your countrymen in India to please reconsider your decision and we will be so happy if India were to come back to RCEP. Thank you, Prof Ko. We have a follow-up question uh, on the on questions concerning Myanmar, and it's from William Kusera. Uh, I'm sorry if I mispronounce your name from Russia, uh, who asks, 
Following on from the Myanmar situation, is there a heightened risk of internal security challenges within other ASEAN member states as a consequence of second and third order effects from the pandemic? Um, <clears throat> the pandemic, the seriousness of the pandemic, as I said in my lecture, varies from country to country. But even in the countries that have the highest number of cases, Indonesia, Philippines, um, the pandemic has not threatened the political stability of those governments. If anything, people tend to flee to safety in a crisis, you know? So in the face of a pandemic, people tend, tend to, to reinforce their support for the government. So I think Bajokowi's position, President Duterte's position, are not weakened, but probably strengthened as a result of COVID-19. And what happened in Myanmar had nothing to do with COVID-19. It, it has everything to do with the internal balance between the democratic forces and the military, the competing aspirations of these two groups of people. Thank you, Prof. We now have a question from Mr. Duk Viet Tran. From Vietnam, is it? Where is he from? Good, good morning, Professor. Uh, I'm sorry, good afternoon. It is actually morning <laughs> here in Geneva. Okay. I, I actually had the pleasure to meet you in Singapore three <laughs> years ago at the external program of the Hay Academy. <laughs> uh, so another question concerning the COVID-19 pandemic. Yeah. Uh, my question is, what are the measures uh, that have been taken at the ASEAN level to ensure integrity checks and uh, promoting transparency of the responses to ensure they do not fall victim to corruption? Thank you, Professor. And unlike the situation in Europe, there's been little acrimony um, between and among ASEAN countries. Yeah? So we cooperate as much as we can. We share uh, best practices. We donate um, medical equipment to each other. We help each other. Um, but, but unlike the European Union, in ASEAN, it is the individual country that are most responsible from their response to COVID-19. It, it's not ASEAN as a group, but the individual country. But there's a lot of coordination. I mean, if you look at the number of ASEAN ministers that have been meeting to coordinate the effort, it's, it's quite amazing, you know? And we're also coordinating our, our response with those of China, Japan, and South Korea. We work closely with WHO. Even at the time when the United States were demonizing WHO, we did not. The 10 ASEAN countries worked very closely with WHO. And one example of our confidence in WHO was that we invited the Director General to join us when we had a virtual summit meeting between ASEAN, China, Japan, and South Korea. You know? So the situation in Southeast Asia is not bad. I mean, is that we're beginning to see a second surge in some of the countries, yeah? but it is, it is compared globally, the situation in Southeast Asia is not as bad as it is in many regions, including those in advanced countries like, like America and Europe. Thank you, Prof Ko. We have a question from Daniel Yao from Singapore. Uh, Danielle, you are muted. Oh, okay, sorry. Uh, good afternoon. Um, and, and thank you, Professor, as always, for a very illuminating lecture. Um, I, I was ruminating about your comments earlier uh, about, um, about ASEAN, uh, mm -hmm. and, and you had comments about transnationalism and the nature of ASEAN. Okay. Um, do you think there are any lessons we can draw um, from uh, the European experience or even the experience in other parts of the world um, that ASEAN can, can draw from going forward. Because one of the challenges here, um, and I think drawing from your comments about Myanmar, a very delicate balance one has to bear mm -hmm. yeah. um, in non-interference. But yeah. the question has always been um, up to what point mm -hmm. and at, at what point will it start yeah. uh, 
testing the limits of credibility okay. um, as okay. to your intact. Um, okay. And it's a question I struggle with myself sometimes. Okay, uh, thank you, Daniel. So let me, let me um, share with you some stories. As you know, when ASEAN decided to embark on the historic process of drafting a charter, first, it appointed 10 elder statesmen from the 10 country, which uh, constituted the group of eminent persons. And the group of emin eminent persons being free agents, you know, produced a very visionary report. And in their report, they said, the charter should contain provision on the suspension and expulsion of member states. So when we were, I, I was the member of the team that drafted the charter. So when we were drafting the charter, we asked our foreign minister, should we include provisions in the charter on suspension and expulsion? And they said, no, no. Then we said, what happens if a country doesn't follow the charter? You know, what, if, what, if, what happens if a country uh, persistently ignored its obligation. They say we will deal with them short of suspending them or expelling them. No. So that's one story. The second story I want to tell you is that when we were drafting the, the principles of the ASEAN Charter, my Thai colleague wanted me to include language in the uh, in let me give you Article 2, Paragraph 2, Subparagraph H, against military coups. As you know, Thailand has suffered from many military coups, you know. So my Thai colleague said, can you put something in the ASEAN Charter against military coup? So I consulted the other colleagues and said, no, no, we, we can't use such blatant language, you know. So I, I, I thought of a, a more subtle formulation. So if, if I may read, uh, 2H to you. 2H say adherence to the rule of law, good governance, the principles of democracy, and constitutional government. Now, the term constitutional government is a code word, you know, against unconstitutional government. It is a subtle, <coughs> it's a subtle way of saying that we, we, we aspire to support democracy, good governance, constitutional government, we don't want unconstitutional government. But the reality is, of course, that no matter what you put in the charter, you can't prevent countries from doing things which they feel are in their own interest, right? So I think in the case of Myanmar, I think the, the evolution of democracy um, has suffered a setback. I don't believe it's the end of the road. There has to be more negotiation between the military and the democratic forces, they must come to some compromise. And I think they, have, they must come to some magic formula for power sharing. And, and we need a new roadmap to democracy in Myanmar. So that's, that's all I'm gonna to say to you. <laughs> Thank you, Prof Ko. Our next question is from Mr. Aloysia Selwas in Indonesia. Um, hello, good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, Professor Ko. Thank you for the center for the opportunity to participate. If I may still tap on the issue of Myanmar. Um, do you think, is there really any ceiling as to the extent of what ASEAN as an organization or its member states can do uh, if the situation in Myanmar gets worsened? And if I also may cultivate or um, benefit from your robust and insightful um, overview of the of the history of ASEAN so far. Do you think do you think you have any instances in the past, uh, any initiative or instances in the in the past in a similar situation like this, where ASEAN as an organization yes. or its members has step in, which yes. can be um, you know example. Yeah. Thank you, Professor. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Very good question. So um, I want to answer it uh, in two ways. Huh? one from the world of experience and one from the charter. So I want to recall that, you know, a few years ago, there was a danger that Cambodia and Thailand will go to war because there were skirmishes on their border over this temple Priya Vihir, you know? And there were actually some um, shootings across at each other and people were killed. 
it was the foreign minister of Indonesia that intervened. But Mati Nataligawa took it upon himself to try to help negotiate a ceasefire, an agreement to seek an amicable solution that's, that's in accordance with international law. So, and, and he even offered to send Indonesian observers to separate the Thai and Cambodian forces, you know? In the end, uh, I think Thailand did not accept his offer, but it's an example of a country taking initiative, in, in this case, Indonesia. And, you know, Indonesia being our biggest country is the natural leader of ASEAN, you know? So I would encourage Indonesia to think about it. But under the charter, under the charter, a special responsibility is given to the ASEAN Secretary General and the ASEAN Chairman in the face of crisis and adversity to use their good offices. And I think, you know, this is a serious situation, you know. So I would ask our current chair, Brunei, our current Secretary General to consult each other on what they can do to help bring about peace and reconciliation between the opposing forces in Myanmar. Yeah. Thank you for your question. Thank you, Prof. Ko. Uh, next, we have a comment from Mr. Suhaimi Tadrudin in Malaysia. Thank you, Ziwei, and thank you, Prof. Yes. Prof. Ko, for your excellent presentation, excellent lecture. Uh, I'm a Malaysian official working within yeah. the ASEAN Circle. Okay. And I also served in Singapore 15 years ago under <laughs> Paramesh Warren. And oh, okay. Good friend. <laughs> have well, negotiations good. together. So I had high admiration of uh, you, Prof. Tomiko. And uh, I agree with um, your presentation that uh, ASEAN has been working very, very hard. I was part of uh, the uh, Malaysian uh, delegation in things that we had in 2020. And even though it was uh, a pandemic period, we worked nonstop. Yeah. I joined uh, uh, the ASEAN Malaysian National Secretariat in July, and we have been working nonstop until that, since, since then, until uh, the summit. And uh, we really addressed all the challenges that uh, you presented earlier, uh, just now, uh, the pandemic, the post-economic recovery, and in uh, maintaining neutrality and in fact we have uh, we have a comprehensive plans and uh, which was documented document, documented and approved by the leaders uh, for all the action that uh, ASEAN has to take in order to address uh, all of them and it wasn't easy but ASEAN has been uh, pragmatic in all its action and especially uh, when engaging with the dialogue partners, ASEAN neutrality has really helped in uh, getting continuous interest from the dialogue partners, not just from the uh, plus the countries, China, Japan, and Korea. We all get uh, increasing interest from Australia, who has been gener generous enough to yeah. contribute a lot to uh, ASEAN actions in uh, all of this. And also, like you mentioned earlier, uh, the interest of the UK to be uh, yeah. part of uh, the ASEAN dialogue partners uh, yeah. following the uh, yeah so uh, ASEAN uh, I, I can see that we really look forward to USA's uh, return to multilateralism yeah. under uh, yeah. the new administration of Mr. Joe Biden and uh, we really hope that ASEAN can continue to be relevant and ASEAN continue to be uh, we, uh, to gain interest from uh, all dialogue partners and uh, other major countries in the world. Thank you, Prof. Thank you for your comment and good to see you. Thank you. We now have a question from Yoon Ao in South Korea. Thank you. Uh, hello from South Korea. Uh, I want to uh, I want to take you um, to the uh, U.S.-China competition. Okay. So it's about your third point. So can you discuss uh, the ASEAN outlook on Indo-Pacific that came out in 2019? Yes. So yes. it was the uh, first ASEAN response to the uh, yes. Indo-Pacific strategy, uh, yes. embracing the, the nomenclature of uh, the term, I mean, Indo-Pacific, yes. but at the same time, uh, I mean, um, 
emphasizing the principle of the, I mean, uh, all inclusiveness. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, refusing to accept the, uh, I mean, China containment elements. Yeah. Yeah. So about the background and utility and implications. I mean, yes. can you say something about okay. that? Yeah, sure. Thank you. Thank you for your good question. Um, the idea of Indo-Pacific was first articulated to former Prime Minister Shinzo Abe in a public lecture in New Delhi. And the strategic thinking behind this proposal is that Japan would like to involve India more in the affairs of this region, you know. See, in, in Japan sees India as a country of the same skill, size, and potential as China. So Japan wants to bring India into the equation so there's more balance in our region, you know? And the United States agree with Japan. So the United States has abandoned the old concept of the Asia Pacific, which we have been familiar with for 30 years. And suddenly they now talk about Indo-Pacific. The main trust of this is to bring India into the center of this equation. We in ASEAN were under pressure on both sides. The Chinese want us to oppose this because they see this as a, a, a subtle language for containment, you know. But the United States, Japan, India want us to support this. So the ASEAN country decided in a very clever way that we will neither support nor oppose it, but we will draft our own outlook, which articulated these principles of openness, inclusiveness, that we support Indo-Pacific, provided it is not meant to contain or, or oppose any country. And in an unintended way, if you look at Indo-Pacific as a region, who is in the center of this region, but ASEAN, you know. So ASEAN's important and role has been elevated by this new concept of Indo-Pacific. But we will not be party to one side or another. We want to be neutral, between the United States and China, between India and China, between Japan and China, our value to the region is that we are friendly to all great powers. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. So we still have a growing number of questions uh, going on. Um, I'm wondering, Prof, if uh, you're okay to keep going with yeah, several more yeah. questions? Yeah, sure, sure. Sure. Um, our next question is from Mr. Tanapat from Thailand. Um, okay, so good, good afternoon, Professor. So thank you for your presentation. It has been really useful for me, and I think it's like most of everyone. So my question is about the um, dispute settlement mechanism under the, um, the ASEAN instrument, I mean, economic instrument. So because like, at, as as we can see that several instruments uh, have been done in the or diplomatic mechanism, which sometimes is not that effective. And sometimes um, the dispute does not end and it has to submit to other, I mean, other international dispute settlement body, for example, the, the ICG, like, you know, the, the case between Thailand and Cambodia, and also some, some of the case had been submitted to the uh, World Trade Organization's uh, settlement body. So I just would like to know your opinion. So how do you think like, in, I mean, we have several economic instruments with the part of the uh, this settlement mechanism. So do you think like in ASEAN's instrument, so is that enough? I mean, what, what is your opinion? Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you, very good question. Um, I think your question is about ASEAN mechanism for dispute settlement versus those under various multilateral treaties that we're all members of, you know? I, I take a very pragmatic approach. I would like to strengthen ASEAN mechanism. And I hope one day that ASEAN member states would have enough confidence in our own dispute settlement mechanism so that when a dispute arises between two member states in ASEAN, they will refer their dispute to an ASEAN mechanism, you know. But the reality is that for the time being, the ASEAN countries have more confidence in the efficacy and impartiality of the dispute settlement mechanism, for example, under WTO, 
or under UNCLOS, you know. So if uh, there's a dispute between two ASEAN countries uh, relating to trade, um, it's more likely than not that the two countries say, let's take it to WTO, you know. And WTO has a well-settled mechanism which involves first negotiations. And if negotiations fail, then they'll set up a dispute panel, you know. Um, it, until President Trump came along and tried to torpedo this dispute settlement system, I think with President Biden, I think United States will probably stop uh, blocking the appointment of panel judges. And I think the WTO dispute settlement mechanism will again become vibrant and, and much used. Huh? And, and it's, a, it's a good one. I must say, having served on three dispute panels, twice as chairman, I must say that uh, it works well. Yeah? And I think that when member states have a trade dispute, they can be sure that the dispute will be adjudicated in a very fair way. And by people who actually take the trouble to, to master the subject and, and to, to pronounce a very fair outcome. In the case of UNCLOS, if two countries have a dispute under UNCLOS, uh, in recent times, you know, both ASEAN countries and other countries in Asia resorted to either arbitration under, under Annex 7, or they've taken it to its laws, you know, and sometimes they take it to ICJ, you know. Um, it's okay. I mean, I, I don't resent it because I have to recognize that those are well-known, well-respected dispute settlement mechanism and countries have a lot of confidence in them. The ASEAN mechanisms are relatively young and so far untested, you know. So we need a bit time of time. I'm hoping that um, that we will begin to use them, you know, and then we will therefore gain experience, confidence, and countries will say, first, can we settle this at the ASEAN level before we take it to the international level? Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Uh, I'm now trying to group questions a little uh, as we move towards the end of the time okay. allocated for this session. Uh, so, Moving on from dispute settlement, yeah. there's a question about neutrality uh, okay. in ASEAN. And this is a question from Sita Nonse, who I believe is here at ICES. Um, what is the definition of ASEAN neutrality? How can we measure it? Can it be affected by the size of trade and investment of its partners outside the region? Um, OK, let, let me recollect my, my position. Huh? I recognize that unlike the European Union, there is no such thing as a, a common ASEAN foreign policy or ASEAN, common ASEAN security policy. We haven't reached that point. So at the moment, it is each individual ASEAN country that would adopt a foreign policy position. And as they are sovereign and independent states, every ASEAN country can decide for itself what is the best thing to do. And therefore, it's not wrong for an ASEAN country to say, uh, I want to be closer to this great power or that great power. That's okay. But I will remind them that when we meet as a group of 10, you must remember that you not only have a national interest, but you have a regional interest. And if you destroy ASEAN, you have destroyed your regional interest. So when we meet as 10, remember, if ASEAN become divided or become partisan, we are no use to anybody. As I say, if ASEAN become pro-China, the United States will destroy them. And if we become pro-US, pro the Chinese will destroy them. The only way we can survive and be useful to the world is to be neutral, friendly to all the great powers, and to continue to play the role that we do now as a neutral convener and neutral chair of the regional processes, you know? This is contingent on our being united and neutral. Thank you, Prof. There's now a group of questions which touch on human rights in ASEAN. Okay. So I am paraphrasing questions from Rahmina Wati in Indonesia, Puja Sharma, uh, I believe in India, and uh, from Huang Tiha. Uh, who is here at ICES in Singapore. Um, 
essentially asking about how the challenges facing ASEAN now, um, how do they and how should they affect ASEAN human rights mechanisms, including the ASEAN Intergovernmental Commission on Human Rights. And at this point, uh, there's a scoping exercise for review under the ASEAN Charter. Um, is it likely that that would touch on these areas of human rights? And from the other side, in civil society and uh, from civil society and NGOs, uh, how do these parts of society, how can they help to support human rights in ASEAN? Okay, well, I, I like to I like to answer this question by um, recalling some history. When we were drafting the ASEAN Charter in 2007, the most controversial issue was human rights. And I recall that in 2007, ASEAN was split into three groups. There were four ASEAN countries that won very strong provisions in the Charter on Human Rights. There were four other countries that were opposed to this. And there were two other countries in the middle, Brunei and Singapore, who sort of um, were neither belonging to one group or another. And arriving at a consensus on human rights was a very difficult thing to do in, in drafting the charter. And the eventual compromise is that we will have a commission on human rights, but it will be intergovernmental in nature, that every ASEAN country would appoint its own representative and the terms of reference will be adopted by consensus. I know that this package of compromises is not satisfactory to many of my friends in civil society. Uh, but my response is that if we didn't arrive at this package of compromises, we would have no commission on human rights. And, and you know, there's nothing to stop a country from appointing a civil society leader as their representative to the ASEAN Intergovernmental Commission on Human Rights in the way that Indonesia has done, you know? So if more government appoint more civil rights leaders to the commission, I think this will change the character of the commission. Over time, over time, the commission will begin to transition from just um, educating the ASEAN people about human rights, promoting human rights, to protecting human rights. We are not there yet, but the we are on that trajectory. So I, I plead for patience and for understanding that this was the most divisive issue we faced in negotiating the Charter in 2007. And if not for these compromises, we wouldn't have the Commission on Human Rights. Thank you, Prof. Uh, I'd now like to invite a question from Alexandra Smith. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Professor Ko. I am calling you today from the United Kingdom, um, oh. and I am the UK's uh, Trade and Economic Counselor to ASEAN out in Jakarta. Uh, so oh, okay. Um, I was very interested by your comments on economic need for growth to be equal across the region and your concern that growth may not be even. I wondered if you had any further thoughts on what direct action ASEAN as a body can take to address this um, in, uh, in support of obviously individual countries' actions to increase their economic growth. Um. The, the happy news is that some of the ASEAN countries that joined ASEAN later, like Vietnam, actually are registering higher growth than the old members. You know, if you look at the, the performance at Vietnam um, last year, 2020, and the projected growth this year, uh, Vietnam will probably have the highest growth rate in ASEAN. And this is a good thing. It just shows that the new member countries Cambodia, Laos, Myanmar, and Vietnam can catch up, you know. They need not continue to lag behind. I think they should look to Vietnam as an example, as an inspiration, yeah. But the rest of us can help. And the Singapore government has, in each of those four countries, uh, we've opened an office in 
Cambodia, Laos, Myanmar, and Vietnam to help share our experience of economic development and development in other areas to help those four countries catch up with the older countries, you know? And, and we're also helping them by, by encouraging our private sector to invest in their economies. And we're also helping them to um, uh, transfer technical assistance. You know? So we spend about, I think, $60 million a year um, by doing a lot of training courses uh, in the ASEAN country. Thank you, Prof. I think we have time for just one more set of questions. And there's a couple of questions here which uh, look to future membership of ASEAN and specifically Timor-Leste. Uh, yeah. So uh, Hananiela Domingo, I'm sorry if I don't pronounce your name well, uh, asks about the prospect for Timor-Leste's yeah. membership. And Aaron Honnebo, yeah. who's uh, with us at CIL, asks if um, ASEAN might possibly consider in its pandemic uh, management efforts and vaccines, whether it's considering the needs of Timor-Leste because that would uh, containment in the region uh, would be impacted by Timor-Leste as well. So I, I want to begin by saying that <clears throat> I'm personally an admirer of Timor-Leste and especially of the, the former president um, Zanana Guzman. Um, I think the, the people of Timor paid a heavy price for their struggle for independence and I wish them well. Uh, the pro, there's an there's a orderly process for admitting Timor Leste to ASEAN and it's a matter of time before uh, Timor Leste join us as a full member. You know, um, we're helping Timor Leste to to, uh, to um, improve its capacity to undertake the obligations of membership. Um, so to my, my brothers and sisters in, in Dili, I would say it's a matter of time before Timor Leste joins ASEAN. In the meantime, we're trying to help you uh, upgrade your human capacity, technical capacity, so that you are able to perform the obligations of membership. Thank you so much, Prof, for taking questions in these many areas. I do see that there are still many hands waiting for questions, but I'm sorry that we're not able to get to everybody today. Um, we hope that you'll forgive us for this and engage in future lectures and future conversations. We will be together for one more month. I'm handing over back to our MC, Yvette. Yes, thank you very much, Professor Cole, for your insightful responses to the many questions posed from our participants. Uh, this marks the end of our public live stream segment. Academy participants, please stay on for our internal program, which will begin shortly. <laughs>